Welcome to The Brief, Tracking the Empire. I'm Nora Barrows-Friedman in California. And I'm John Elmer in Toronto. On this episode, the golden age of pirates and the disruption of early capitalism on the seas. This notion that the pirates were kind of romantic heroes, that idea actually existed when the pirates were still out on the seas. And a lot of people respected them for standing up to these rich men who ruled the world. They were kind of working class heroes. We speak with Marcus Redeker about pirates, the pirate ship, and the revolutionary Atlantic. Hi, Nora. Hey, John. How's it going? Oh, it's going all right. We're going to take a little break from all the things that we would normally talk about in this little introduction, and uh, we're going to dedicate this episode to something not in your news feed today. We're going to give the full show to historian Marcus Redeker, who has spent his life uncovering the buried history of the working class struggle on the seas. Yeah, it's fantastic and definitely a much needed break from uh, from the news feed. Let's get right into it. Let's do it. The briefing. The period we are focusing on particularly is the latter part of what is known as the Golden Age of Piracy, so roughly 1670 to 1730. It's an era that overlaps and then gives way to the formalization of the structures of European colonialism and empire, and indeed the realizations of the concepts that we know today as race, class, and nationalism that have defined modern capitalism. It's the era of the plantation and the slave trade development. And it's a period that is addressed most commonly by historians in terms of commodities and trade routes, nations and empires, royals and captains. It's always an official history. But Redeker's work seeks to upend that official history by situating the seafarer at the center of the story. And the ship itself, not simply as a technology driving imperialism, but as a workplace and a site of struggle. Animated by the decidedly self-aware class consciousness, the pirate ship was a principled, radical democracy and egalitarian workspace that stood in stark contrast to the ruthless hierarchies of national navies and merchant ships of the time, and indeed in contrast to the disenfranchisement that prevailed on land in the era. It was a world turned upside down, the authority on the ship derived by the collective, The pirates themselves were an internationalist assembly, a mixed multitude, multiracial, multiethnic, multinational, a motley crew, dispossessed and underclass in the land-based economy. But once you became a pirate, a pirate you remained. There was no retirement package. The governments of the time said that pirates had no country, and the pirates agreed. When they hailed a ship on the ocean flying the skull and crossbones flag, pirates rejected nationalist designations and declared, we come from the sea. So yeah, Marcus Redeker is a historian, activist, and author with over three decades of research on the Atlantic. Redeker is the author of The Many-Headed Hydra, Sailors, Slaves, and Commoners, and The Hidden History of the Revolutionary Atlantic, Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea, the Anglo-American Maritime World, 1700 to 1750, Villains of All Nations, A People's History of the Pirates, among others. He's also written about the Amistad Rebellion and the history of the slave ship. Let's get right into it. This is a fascinating interview. Yeah, so let's go to Nora speaking with Marcus Redeker. Thank you for joining us, Marcus. We're delighted to have you on the show. Thank you, Nora. It's a pleasure to be with you. You've written extensively about the ocean as central to understanding the rise of capitalism and the formation of race and class and property. Everyone writes about history as though the oceans, which cover three quarters of the planet, don't exist. Can you talk about how history of the ocean is central to not just the formation of capitalism, but of labor struggles and, and also the you know, designations of race and class. You're absolutely right in mentioning the fact that we have this bias in our thinking, which basically is quite uninspected. We've never really thought it through. But the assumption is that only the landed places on the Earth's surface are real. 
that the that the the oceans, the seas, the the watery portion of the globe, which is the largest part of it, is somehow unreal, an unreal place between the real spaces of history, which are landed and usually national, but in fact, lots of history happened at sea. The sea is not a historical void. Very important things happen there, issues of class formation, race formation, empire building. All of these have really powerful maritime components. So if we want to understand the history of this planet, we have to really take very seriously this notion of maritime endeavor, of ships and sailors and how all this happened. Because, Nora, the European deep sea sailing ship really was the most important machine in the history of capitalism. In in this sense, the ship was the way in which capitalists in Western Europe organized the world economy beginning in the late 16th and throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, these ships linked and connected the continents. Blue water empires were built. The world market evolved. And this then brings us to the primacy of sailors, because these ships could not sail themselves, despite what economic historians might have you believe, because they just talk about the ships and the commodities without talking about the sailors whose labor made all of this possible. So it's been my life's work, you might say, to revisit the history of capitalism, its origins, and its especially its early development, and talk about the central place of sailors and ships and all that, because without that technology, the ship really was a technology, and without those workers aboard that ship, world capitalism doesn't happen, or at least it doesn't happen in the way that it did. Talk about some of the stories that you've focused on of these very grassroots formations of early democratic societies, basically, aboard a ship, a thousand sailors working together and creating this mini society and how that informs this notion of the labor economy and fighting against the elite and the owner class. The place to begin is uh, essentially to know that seafaring was a job for poor people, usually dispossessed people, people who couldn't get a job on land. In fact, there's an old saying in the 18th century that says, he who cannot get work by land must work at sea. This is important to know. It was a really dangerous line of work. People on board ships trusted their lives to each other every single day. These are really very small, brittle, wooden vessels that they sail all around the world. And so it's, it's dangerous. There's high mortality rates for sailors. The wages are very low. The quality of food is very poor. And the discipline, the labor discipline, as meted out by ship captains, is extremely violent. In other words, the more or less unchecked power of the ship captain is a very important part of the age of sail. So what I've argued is that within this hierarchy on board ships, merchant ships, naval ships, really most kinds of ships, there is a culture of the lower deck an oppositional culture, bonding of common sailors against those they consider to be their class enemies, both on the ship and on shore. And that this lower deck culture is really very important for understanding a different world that is struggling to emerge. And we do see it emerge in two big ways. First, let me talk about the origin of the term strike. Everybody knows this word to strike was basically to withdraw human labor, to make production come to a halt. It is a very important part of working class power historically, the ability to cease production. But almost no one knows that this is a maritime phrase. And we go back to the year 1768 in London, which was at that time 
probably the most powerful city in the world, the heart of the British Empire, a big, thriving, trading port city. And in 1768, there was, along the waterfront, a wage dispute. Merchants had sort of unilaterally slashed the wages of sailors, and the sailors decided to fight back. And the way they did that was by going from ship to ship and taking down the sails. That's called striking the sails. You strike the sail of the ship, the ship can't move, Commerce comes to a crashing halt, and suddenly the working class has a new kind of power in this thing called the strike. That is a, a very important part of the history of seafaring people. The other place where you see this kind of uh, culture of the lower decks emerging is in uh, piracy. We'll talk a little bit about the, the golden age of piracy. This is from roughly 1670 to about 1730. There are three different generations of pirates within that time span. The first are what are called the buccaneers. A man named uh, Henry Morgan is probably the best example of that generation in which people based in Jamaica would try to capture the silver of the Spanish main. You have a second generation in the 1690s epitomized by William Kidd. But more interestingly, I think a man named Henry Avery who was really considered to be the first uh, maritime Robin Hood. Uh, he captured a lot of wealth at sea and managed to escape the authorities completely. And then you have a third generation in the 17-teens and 1720s, and this is the one that I've studied most closely. And this is the one that gives us all of the symbolism that now permeates popular culture. Uh, the black flag with the skull and the crossbones comes from this generation. Some of the most famous figures like Edward Teach, known as Blackbeard, comes from this generation. And uh, what I've discovered was that this culture of the lower deck, as created by common sailors, was actually institutionalized on board the pirate ship. So that thing that was struggling to get out, but which was held in check by relations of power, finally uh, finds a space of freedom on these ships that have been taken and reorganized, we suddenly see a different social order emerge. You talk about the phrase, a motley crew, a multiracial, multiethnic, multinational group of people from many different ports coming together on the ship within that working class structure. Can you talk a little bit about who these pirates were and where did they come from? Yes, the, the, the pirates were basically common sailors. I mean, the Hollywood version is that some aristocrat is wronged and goes out to sea to take his revenge. But the truth is, pirates were not aristocrats. <laughs> they, they were ordinary working class people who had labored on naval ships and on merchant ships where they experienced all those terrible conditions I mentioned earlier, the low wages, the poor food, the violent discipline. And they had just decided that they had had enough. Enough was, was kind of their attitude. So when piracy broke out in, let's say, 1715, 1716, you had, you had some mutinies in which common sailors took over their ships and reorganized them as pirate ships. They would create a black flag. They would fly under that flag. But basically, there were mutineers. But in fact, most people became pirates. When their vessel was captured, a prize vessel, I mean, these are people just working as sailors on a vessel that pirates capture. And when the pirates come on board the, the prize vessel, after the prize vessel has surrendered, and they do almost always surrender, because you don't want to fight against pirates, you're not going to win. And if you do get lucky and kill a couple of them, when they, when they do capture you, they're not going to be in a good mood about it. So quick surrender was always the best thing. So the pirates would come on board this captured vessel, and rather than immediately start looting and plundering, which they would do eventually, they would enact a drama. They would call all the sailors of that captured ship up on deck, and they would take the captain, who is now their prisoner, and they would ask the assembled sailors, how does this captain treat you? Wow. Now you can imagine how that captain felt. Because if 
the sailors say, our captain treats us very badly. He doesn't pay us our wages. He bilks us of our wages. Our food is terrible. And worst of all, he beats us. He flogs us without reason. That captain is in a lot of trouble. And it was not uncommon for pirates to take that captain and lash him to the same place where he would lash his sailors when he administered a flogging and give him literally the beating of his life. And in some cases, they actually executed these captains. So at that point, after the pirates have made this performance, this ritualized performance of taking vengeance on behalf of these common sailors, they then say to those sailors, okay, boys, who's with us? You want to come with us? Well, if you said something badly against your captain, and he was still going to be in control of that ship when the pirates leave, you had better go with the pirates, because that captain would give you a a whooping like you couldn't believe. So most people became pirates by joining up from captured vessels. So that means they were basically just common sailors aboard those vessels. That's who they were. That's where they came from. But important to know that seafaring was an extremely international occupation. If you go back even to the early uh, long voyages of discovery by Columbus and Magellan, the members of those crews were extremely multi-ethnic. You had Dutch and French and Greek and African and Irish sailors on board these ships, Italian. So the motley crew is a feature of seafaring from a very early phase. And that continues to be true in the era of uh, piracy, the golden age of piracy. They were called the villains of all nations. I use that as the title for a book that I wrote because it summarizes perfectly the fact that these people were acting out a drama on board these ships. They really were villains to the ruling classes of the day. And they really were of all nations. Tell us about the uh, origin of the skull and crossbones flag and how it's permeated popular culture three, four hundred years later. Where did that come about? It's fascinating because most people have no idea what it means. Most people just think it means you're a badass, right? That <laughs> don't mess with me, right? It's like these uh, the symbol of the skull and crossbones has become what one tattoo artist told me. It's a symbol of defiant life that no matter how bad things may be, we're fighting on. And then, then that's, a, that's a good meaning. But, but basically, the origins of the skull and crossbones on pirate flags is really significant and revealing. What I discovered in doing research about life at sea in the 18th century was that captains kept their logbooks and they would note the weather and, you know, when they'll come to port and, you know, any sort of business of the voyage. The owner of the ship would usually require the captain to keep a log. In that logbook, when a sailor died, a captain would frequently note that by drawing a skull and crossbones. It's just a symbol of mortality. It's what's called a death's head. What pirates did was take the symbol of a common sailor's death and put it on their flag in this defiant way so as to say, our work is lethal. We die at very young ages, but now we're going to appropriate the symbol of death and we're going to sail under it and we're going to live. We're going to live while we can. Pirates had a phrase, Nora, they used to say, a merry life and a short one. And by that they meant, look, the sailor's life is very hard. For a little while, we're going to live it up, right? And we're going to live on our own terms. So that the skull and crossbones on the flag actually had two meanings. When the pirates would run it up the mainmast and another vessel would see it, the most immediate meaning was, you better surrender right now or you're in big trouble surrender or die. That's the first level of meaning. But beneath that, there's a whole set of commentaries on the sailor's life. Because on these flags, it was sometimes a skull and crossbones. More commonly, it was an entire skeleton. And the skeleton was holding an hourglass, meaning our time is limited. 
we as sailors don't have a lot of time. There was also frequently a weapon striking a human heart with a few drops of blood coming out of it. These things all bespoke a consciousness of of sailors as having been preyed upon by the merchant shipping industry and the Royal Navy, and now they were going to invert that symbolism and fight back under it. So that's really the meaning of the black flag. It has a very radical kind of uh, origin, which, which says we reject the exploitation that we have known, and we're building something different. That's fascinating. Marcus, can you talk a little bit about the organization of the pirate ship? The most revealing thing about pirates, in my view, and the thing that I think was most convincing in terms of telling us who they really were. You know, when I started this work, Nora, I had a very simple question. What did pirates think they were doing? And why were they willing to do it? Who did they think they were? And that really comes out when it's time to organize the social order of their ship. Now, bear in mind that all these people have come from other ships with really hierarchical and and violent ways of organizing social life. Sailors frequently had serious scars on their backs from the floggings they had taken, and, and they would brag about them in this culture of opposition. You know, they would take off their shirts and show their scars and say, yeah, I got this after a mutiny in 1715. It became a source of pride. But what these sailors did was they brought that experience on those other vessels and they radically transformed it into a vision of a new world. First thing they did was to elect their captains. Now, you'd have to understand what ships were like in order to know how radical uh, a practice this would be. Poor people didn't have the right to elect anybody to anything in this time period. They had no voting rights whatsoever, right? So to say, we're going to select our captain was a very powerful statement saying essentially that the, the bloated powers of these violent captains on these other ships is something that we are going to limit. We're going to make sure that the captain does not act the way captains usually act at sea. So they elected a captain, and then they elected a quartermaster. And this is a a very important uh, position on a pirate ship. And the quartermaster's job was basically twofold. One, to keep an eye on the captain and make sure that he doesn't abuse his power. And two, to divide up the loot equally among everybody. That's a very important job. You've got to have somebody that you really trust. So pirates basically created these democracies on board the ship, even though they came out of the most authoritarian kinds of uh, backgrounds on other ships. So so they, they do something very different. The other thing they do is make it clear that real authority on board a pirate ship lies with the collective. It lies with the crew. If they elect a man as captain and they don't like the way he behaves, they will depose him immediately and they might even throw him overboard if he does things that remind them too much of what they saw in their lives as common sailors. So the democratic nature, and, and, and we, there's a lot of evidence about this. These Sometimes these merchant captains were captured and so they, they're watching these pirate ships and they say things like, they debate everything. They call a council, and that's everybody who's on board the ship, and they debate. What are they going to do? What should we do with this prisoner? So-and-so deserted his position during battle. What should we do? Right? What's the discipline that we collectively will decide upon? So you have a really unusually democratic kind of decision-making. The other thing is that if democracy was one value, equality was another. And this is crucial because if you look at those other ways of organizing the distribution of resources at sea, if you look at uh, naval ships and merchant ships, there is a tremendous hierarchy from the top of the pay scale to the bottom. Uh, In the Navy, it could be, you know, 100 to 1. In the merchant shipping industry, it might, depending on the profit uh, incentives the captain has, it might be... 6 to 1, 8 to 1, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, 30 to 1. But pirates radically compressed the scale. They divided things up not in terms of wages. They didn't see themselves as wage earners anymore. They considered themselves to be common owners of the ship. 
and therefore partners. So they divided up everything they got in shares. And the lowest common sailor would get one share. And maybe the skilled workers on board, the carpenter, uh, Cooper, something like that, might get one and a quarter. The quartermaster might get one and a half. And the captain would usually get two shares. Now, that's because the captain you had to have navigational knowledge. There were certain things that the captain could do that others couldn't do. And they wanted a good, knowledgeable sailor to be in charge of their ship. So they did give the captain additional rewards. But notice, two to one compared to 20 to one or 100 to one. So equality is very much part of what they're doing. And, and this, by the way, the democracy and the equality become ways of recruiting common sailors to join them. They say, look, what's it like on your ship? Look how we do it. This is the place for common sailors. We have power over here on these ships. So this democratic and egalitarian social order of pirates to me is is probably the single most important thing about them. And it helps us to see how that culture of the lower deck was institutionalized on the pirate ship. You know, one of the effects of the danger of life at sea was to create a very high level of solidarity. Sailors were known for solidarity. They created uh, a kind of fictive kinship with other people on their vessels. They called them brother tars or brother sailor. Uh, so, So that also gets implemented on the pirate ship in a really important way. Can we talk about women pirates, which is also left out of mythology and most history about the life on the sea? But you've written about pirates like Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, who you write, cursed and swore like sailors, carried their weapons like those well-trained in war, and boarded prize vessels as only the most daring, respected pirate crews did, seizing liberties usually reserved for men. Tell us about them. One of the things that historians have discovered was that in this period, in the 17th and 18th century, lots of women dressed as men and went to sea. Uh, Now that we've actually started looking for them, we found a lot of them. Uh, There were apparently hundreds of them in the uh, Dutch East India service. And so it doesn't come as a surprise that uh, these two women you've mentioned, Anne Boddy and Mary Reed, turned up on a pirate ship dressed as men. Uh, What is a little odd is that they turned up on the same pirate ship. Hmm. Uh, Now, what are are the odds of that? But but basically, um, they were people who had positions of leadership. I mean, they weren't captains, but they led boarding parties. They were considered to be very well-respected members of the crew. Uh, I'll just mention briefly how they both came to sea. Uh, Mary Reed had actually been a soldier uh, in the War of Spanish Succession. So she was very, very skilled in all the arts of war. She was on a ship going towards the West Indies when it was captured by the vessel that Anne Bonny was already on with her lover, Calico Jack Rackham, who was the captain. And she decided to join the pirates without knowing who Anne Bonny was. So these two eventually become very close, Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, and they discover their common secret. And they do end up uh, both coming out as women. In other words, once they had won the respect of their shipmates, they didn't need to, to maintain this male identity anymore. This caused some conflict on board the ship because women were not usually present on deep sea sailing ships, but these two were respected. So just to let you know how tough they were, when they were captured in 1720 by uh, a Jamaican vessel that had actually gone looking for them, it turns out most of the men on board their ship were drunk. And when this vessel appeared and when it was clear that they were going to have to fight, Most of the men went down into the hold of the ship to hide. Mary Reed, Anne Bonney, and one other pirate, a man, stayed up on the deck to fire the cannon to try to make the other vessel leave them alone, but they failed. They were all captured. They were all taken into Port Royal, Jamaica, and tried. Well, Anne Bonney and Mary Reed weren't tried because they were both pregnant. But Calico Jack Rackham and several of the other male pirates were tried and taken to the place of execution. 
And at that place of execution, Jack has the rope around his neck and he gives a sort of imploring look to Anne Bonnie. And uh, Anne Bonnie says back to him, Jack, don't look at me that way, because if you had fought like a man, you wouldn't be hanged like a dog right now. So she was a pretty tough character, and so was Mary Reed. But these women were highly symbolic. They were very well known in their day and age. But this was also a time, uh, Nora, where there were lots of what were considered to be warrior women. There were lots of stories and songs about women who did this kind of thing. And I'm sure there were songs created about Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, and they demonstrated that uh, freedom could be found by women under the Jolly Roger. Speaking about songs, the etymology of the term spinning a yarn had its origins on pirate ships. It's come to mean telling a story, you know, incorporating folklore into tradition, oral tradition. Can you talk about the way that pirates helped create mythology and how the life of pirates has influenced both language and literature? Yes. You know, one of the really uh, unusual things about pirates, or at least some pirates, is that they were very conscious of the fact that they were acting out a drama on the world stage. In other words, they were conscious of the image of themselves that they were creating. And nobody was more important in this regard than Edward Teach, known as Blackbeard. Edward Teach was, first of all, a very, very big man, probably six foot eight inches tall in a time when the average man was about five foot four. He was a huge man. He had a very uh, big head of bushy black hair and a big black beard, hence his nickname. And he actually cultivated the image of himself as satanic in order to try to scare everybody into doing what he wanted them to do. So, for example, when his vessel would in, engage in a fight with a prize vessel, sometimes they would put up resistance, Edward Teach would come on board and he would take sparklers, literally, and put the sparklers in his hair and in his beard and light them so that when he went into battle, there was this kind of burning aura around his head. And a lot of people looked at him and thought, my God, that's Lucifer. That's the devil himself. I mean, it, he absolutely terrified people. But, but it's, it's so fascinating to me that he was so conscious of the symbolism of doing this. And I think that was actually true for a lot more pirates than just himself. So pirates coming out of a world in which yarn spinning was an art wanted to do things that would make other people spin yarns about them. And they succeeded in this. Pirate stories became an incredibly important international means of communication, these yarns. And so in a very real way, what I've come to conclude is that the pirates of that era, even though they were executed in huge numbers, the British and French governments spent massive amount of money to hunt them down and to execute them. And then after the hangings, like the one with Jack Rackham, they would, rather than do the body the respect of being buried, they would hang the body up in chains, as it was called, in the harbor, so that whenever a sailor came in on a ship, he would see, look, this is what we do to pirates, and you better not join them. Despite this extraordinary campaign of annihilation, there's no other way to put it. Hundreds and hundreds of pirates were hanged. Despite that, pirates lost the battle but won the war because we don't remember the people who executed them. We remember them for the heroic things that they did, kind of gathering up all their courage and, and heading out to sea and trying to live a life of freedom in a time when that was really hard to do. They won the battle. And one reason that they won the battle was because they won the battle of storytelling, that common sailors would take stories of pirates into the lower deck, you know, and I knew this pirate and I knew that pirate. And let me tell you this story about Blackbeard and so this is actually something that they achieved. The currency that they have, the place they have in popular culture, is in many ways a function of their self-consciousness about winning hearts and minds. 
You mentioned how Western European empires crushed the pirates. But before that happened, what was the impact that pirates had on the empire? How can we measure the extent of their victories? Well, I think we would, we would measure their impact in two ways. First of all, in this third generation of pirates, the ones in the 17-teens and 1720s, there is absolutely no doubt that they created a major crisis in the Atlantic trading system. And now, now, bear in mind that this Atlantic trading system, which involves the slave trade, it involves sugar production, tobacco production, the circulation of manufactures and textiles, it really is, the Atlantic really is the cradle of capitalism. Of course, the ship is one of its main instruments. You've got to realize that this system is immensely valuable to people of property all around the Atlantic, and the pirates seriously disrupted it. And how they did that was by capturing literally thousands of vessels. I think at one point I, I found that they had captured something like 2,400, 2,500 vessels and destroyed a lot of them. Some of them they actually turned back over to the captain. If his crew said that he treated them well, they might just give him a ship back and go on about their way. So this created such a crisis. It got to the point where pirate attacks were so frequent that merchants would see vessels out off the coast, you know, of Philadelphia, for example, or New York or uh, Kingston, Jamaica, and they'd say, we can't send the trade out because those are probably pirates. Now, they may not have been pirates at all, but they created this fear factor, which was uh, enormously important. And specifically, they disrupted the slave trade. This is very important to know. Pirates disrupted the slave trade, not by capturing vessels full of enslaved people. They didn't do that or rarely did that. There were some pirates in the Indian Ocean who were involved in the slave trade. But the Atlantic pirates, by and large, wanted the well-stocked slave ships with a large amount of space for a big crew. So many famous pirate ships began as slave ships. But their presence on the west coast of Africa was so disruptive to the slave traders that it was actually a group of slave trading merchants who petitioned the British parliament to dispatch a squadron of naval vessels to go and engage them and try to clear out that group of pirates so that the slave trade could properly resume. So the disruption to trade, the trade crisis, I would say, is one major measure of um, how pirates not only threatened, but actually undermined empire and capitalism. The second way they undermined it was by providing this subversive example of a different way of living. There's no doubt in my mind that when merchants and royal officials went after pirates, it was not only because those people attacked the property of these merchants and interfered with the revenues of the king. It wasn't only that reason. It was because they had demonstrated that you could run a ship in a completely different way from what was common on both naval and merchant vessels. And, and so they felt like they had to eradicate that example. They had to punish the people who dared to try to live differently. I would say that this is actually a very common thing for empires to do. We look at the response to the Cuban Revolution, to Vietnam, to Nicaragua. There's always a desire to try to crush those kinds of movements so that those events are not allowed to rupture a model of domination. And I think pirates had ruptured a model of domination on board ships, and that was an unforgivable crime to the uh, ruling classes of the day. What would you say would be the flashpoint in terms of when piracy, what precipitated that? Well, I would mention two things. First of all, the British government, who led the way in all this, they had the, the strongest stake in the Atlantic system at that time decided that the most important thing they could do would be to isolate pirates from their bases of support. And those bases of support tended to be in the Caribbean, usually small ports, smaller merchants, people who, you know, like trading with pirates because they could get things a lot more cheaply. 
1721, the British government passed a new law saying that anyone who traded with pirates would be subject to capital punishment exactly like the pirates themselves were. And this actually did have the effect of making the pirates more isolated and easier to sort of chase down. A second thing that happened was that that squadron of vessels I mentioned a moment ago coming from Britain to the west coast of Africa had a major battle with the biggest and most successful pirate of that era. There was a man named Bartholomew Roberts. He was a Welshman. He was known as Black Bart Roberts. He commanded a whole flotilla of pirate ships, and the vessel that he was on was one of the biggest warships of the day. They had captured a Dutch man-of-war with 44 cannons on board. So when this squadron of, of naval vessels went after Roberts, they actually just got lucky because they came upon Roberts at a time when most of the crew was drunk. And as it happened, they were not ready to fight. They couldn't fight. They were defeated in battle. I think 52 pirates were executed at one of the slave trading factories in West Africa. Some of those were black pirates. So that was kind of a turning point. When the biggest and baddest of them all, partly just because of bad luck, was defeated by the British government, I think that you might say that took the wind out of the pirates' sails. They began to decline in 1722. And there were some bloody skirmishes and some other you know, battles at sea. But by 1726, they were basically gone. Deep sea piracy was, was no longer being practiced on a significant scale. But the stories of the pirates went back below decks and circulated and continued to live on among maritime people and among the broader population. Because this notion that the pirates were kind of romantic heroes, that idea actually existed when the pirates were still out on the seas. And a lot of people respected them for standing up to these rich men who ruled the world. They were kind of working class heroes. And now, you know, 300, 400 years later, what are the commonalities between these pirates and modern day pirates in Somalia or the Gulf of Guinea? What is the common thread there? You know, several years ago, Nora, when piratical attacks off the Somalian coast were very common, and there were a couple of high-profile ship captures, I repeatedly got calls from journalists who basically all said the same thing. What they really were saying in their questions was, please tell us that these pirates were not anything like the romantic pirates of the past that live on in popular culture. They, they didn't want these poor people in Somalia to be seen in the same way. And my answer was always the same. I would say they're just like them. They're the same. It's, they're poor people with uh, control of a certain advanced technology. They see they themselves have been immiserated by capitalism. I mean, one of the big causes of piracy in Somalia is the overfishing of the traditional fishing grounds of the Somalian people by European fishing fleets so that their ability to get a living was very, very seriously reduced by these vessels that are part of the current European empire. They did what other poor people would do. They see this wealth floating by in a big ship, and they decide to attack it because they haven't gotten very many other options. And most of these Somalian pirates were former fishermen. So I think there are some very interesting similarities between pirates going all the way back to Greek antiquity, through the Golden Age, and up to the present. The stories about the pirates lives on, and I think it is something that can inspire us to try to imagine something better for the future. I think that's our big job right now. We have to, we have to be imaginative. We have to struggle for new ideas as well as new practices. And I think history can help us in this regard. I think the example of other people and how they fought to build something new and something different, even though they failed in the short term, can still help us think about the future. Marcus, thank you so much for this discussion and for being with us on The Brief. My pleasure, Nora. Thank you. 
Well, that was a lot of fun. Marcus is great. I uh, look forward to having him back on the show. He's written more than we can talk about in one podcast. Um, (laughs) It's even difficult to know which book to pick of all of the, you know, the books all weave together a narrative that is, you know, as soon as you finish one book, I was looking for the next. So, yeah. I really got into Villains of All Nations, a people's history of pirates. I think, it, I mean, just his his writing is beautiful, but the stories, you know, that he weaves in are just, I, I mean, I felt like it was, you know, a, a people's history. It was like in the tradition of Howard Zinn, really diving through these historical records and picking out the most kind of salient, illustrative stories of of actual people who were disrupting capitalism and organizing working class movements. Just absolutely beautiful. So definitely check out his writing. And he's got a a new book coming out. Yeah. Yeah. I just saw that the Graphic History Collective has uh, just finished work on an adaptation of Redeker's The Fearless Benjamin Lay, his latest book about an 18th century radical Quaker abolitionist. And it's a graphic novel coming out from Beacon Press in autumn 2021, which looks like a future bookend for us. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And and as you said, um, we'll definitely have him back on the brief to discuss the subsequent era of abolition and seafarer resistance to the slave trade. Thanks for listening. Thanks, guys. See you next time. The Brief is produced by Pierre Loisel in Quebec. Nora Barrows-Friedman in California. And I'm John Elmer in Toronto. Our music is by Greg Wilson. Follow us on Twitter at The Brief Pod. Find us on the web at thebriefpodcast.com. And support our work by subscribing at Patreon. Patreon.